And so that's what really sparked my interest to open a restaurant here in Vermont is just the availability, the seasonality, uh, the community especially. Mm -hmm. uh, community is a huge part of our philosophy and concept here and just to support as fully as that we can. Hello everyone, welcome back to Gay Chill Crafts. I'm Sarah Scully and I'm here with Josh Walker and Robert Mahoney of Wild Roots Restaurant in Royalton, Vermont. Thanks guys for joining me. Um, full disclosure, Wild Roots is the uh, best nice restaurant nearby. We come here frequently and we've really enjoyed it um, the last, uh, have you guys been open a year yet? A year and four weeks. Okay, congratulations. Happy birthday. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, we really like it, but I wanted to sit down and talk with these guys about sort of their food philosophy and, you know, why they've started a restaurant and all that good stuff. Um, so let's start at the beginning with you, Josh. I know that you met your wife, um, Jane, who's not here with us, but she's also involved um, in the restaurant industry, right? Or bartend you were bartending? Uh, I was actually a doorman at a bar in Vail, Colorado, oh. and Jane was a level two sommelier at a restaurant called the Swiss Chalet which is more the less a fondue restaurant. Okay. Uh, she was in charge of a 6,000 bottle wine inventory. Wow. And I was just more in charge of kind of bar maintenance, um, orders, different things along that line. But yeah, mm -hmm. we, we met in the industry in Colorado. Uh, we both loved working in hospitality and um, decided to come out to Vermont, uh, Jane's homeland, and start a restaurant for her. Okay, cool. That makes sense now, the Vermont connection. Yeah, because you grew up out west as well, right? Correct. In yeah. Vermont, New Mexico. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I was wondering where the Vermont connection came in. So, um, you know, I like I like food, I like wine, I like going to restaurants, but I don't own my own restaurant, so I'm always curious what what kind of sets the match to people and, and makes them say, yeah, I'm going to do this for a career versus just as a hobby or you know, a food writer or something else that seems like less stressful. <laughs> yeah, so I guess really what drove us to be uh, restaurant owners and entrepreneurs was really just the idea of we had worked in hospitality uh, beforehand and had worked with uh, many managers, owners, and just felt like we had the uh, experience to open up our own restaurant, but mm -hmm. also uh, in a place where we feel as if there is so much variety and availability for us through the farms. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what really sparked my interest to open a restaurant here in Vermont is just the availability, the seasonality, uh, the community especially. Mm -hmm. uh, community is a huge part of our philosophy and concept here and just to support as fully as that we can. Yeah. Those around you. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. And Robert, what, what drew you to, you know, life as a professional chef again versus maybe um, just being a really good home cook or, uh, you know, something else? Um, how, how did you make that jump? Well, it's kind of down you know, the path. Uh -huh. Once I got here, started out just shorter, but anyway, the deeper I got into food, the more I realized how important it was to actually, you know, work with local communities, actually mm -hmm. get the product from the ground level up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and you started out in New York City cooking, is that right? Well, Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York, okay. There. Um, spent the first 25 years of my life there, decided to go to New York, learned a little bit more at a quicker pace, and yeah, uh -huh. most other places I could, and after that I landed my first executive chef job back in Buffalo, Yep. kind of progressed through there. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I wanted to work with a place that had phenomenal produce and mm -hmm. yeah, decided on Vermont to be my new home. So. Yeah, that's great. It's been lovely having your food here yeah. <laughs> as a diner. Yeah. It's quite amazing just to be able to use um, local farms versus big purveyors like Cisco. Uh, we do use Black River for minor things, um, but also work with Vermont uh, Provision. Uh, entities such as uh, provisions out of White River Junction, mm -hmm. um, but really we source 100% from the farms. I think right now we have at least, I think, 20 to 30 farms that we're working with, and wow. we're always welcoming to foragers, those people who uh, are out there just kind of in the wilderness looking uh, for these um, edible goods that are, you know, kind of in your backyard, if you will. So that's mm -hmm. kind of another add-on to the story here is that we have foragers who come constantly knocking on the door, like just before you arrive, I think had a guy who brought eight pounds of 
chicken of the wood. Oh, um, great. Right. Yeah, so, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, like, fiddleheads and ramps and all the things that grow. Certainly. Grow around here. That's very cool. Um, yeah, and it's, it's interesting to me. I mean, it, it almost seems... Um, so when Rick and I moved up here before we got our garden established, we joined a CSA, and we like to watch cooking shows too. I know, Robert, that was like something that kind of started you pretty early on. Was like watching uh, watching chefs on TV, um, but we called it our Iron Chef box. You know, box of the week. And uh, CSAs have evolved a lot, I would say, in the last five years or so. Um, but when they were first starting out, it was just, yeah, you get this, and if you don't know what it is, or you don't know how to cook it, or you've never tasted it before, it's just an adventure. Um, it, so it almost seems like you're doing that on a restaurant level, because, you know, obviously, Robert, you have more experience with the ingredients, but in terms of availability and stuff, you still have that limitation. Is that, do you feel limited, or do you feel inspired? I feel inspired more than anything. It's yeah. fascinating, like, at this current time of year especially, there's mm -hmm. such limited produce available. It's by 99% leafy greens, even less forage okay. is leafy greens. So mm -hmm. figuring out creative ways to actually use mm -hmm. all those products and you know create mm -hmm. a cohesive menu. It's not just oh well, here's your pesto. Well, in different ways. Right. Yeah, actually, uh, Are you opening a pesto bar soon? Because I will come to that. So <laughs> town, so yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's that's good. Well, I'm glad you're inspired by the. Um, I guess in some ways restriction can be good. I know if I have a deadline or a, you know, a very focused kind of project, sometimes I'm more made it, motivated to do it than if yeah. it's just like, do whatever you want. You can it's buy whatever not, you want. It almost, <laughs> almost drives ambition and creativity. Yeah. And pushing you to uh, beyond what you thought you could do. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, it's a little bit of self-satisfaction, but also, you know, satisfaction of the bigger picture that you're continuing to uh, utilize local product and maybe a different cooking method that they had not seen before. Uh, especially for our farmers who come in and dine with us, um, trying the food that they've either grown or raised on their farm, uh, and then just getting to try it in a way that maybe they haven't had it before. So yeah, Kate Kate McLean of Longest Acres was talking about that in her interview um, about like swapping recipes and tips when she would sell beef to restaurants and, and just talking to the chefs about well, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> yeah, yes. Oh, tell me more about that. That's, That's really great, cool. Because the farmers yeah. know their product better than anyone. Right. You know, and the, and the chef, our chef, Robert, he knows how to cook it better than anyone. Mm -hmm. So, it's, you know, you have those two factors, and then you combine it, and mm -hmm. you're going to end up with great food no matter what. So the one thing that we really want people to know when they dine here is you're not only supporting us as a restaurant, but also the community and the farmers and the artisans and everyone who's involved. Exactly. Yeah, down to the, the tableware and stuff. I know that you guys are going to get plates from Two Potters soon, right? Yeah, very exciting. It's, yeah. Been, uh, it's been in the works for a little while, but we're looking mm -hmm. yeah, to get our entire plateware uh, with Two Potters as well as a couple of other local uh, potter artisans. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, really yeah. everything in the restaurant, including the art, um, on the walls that you see when you come here, our sign out front, everything has a local story mm -hmm. behind it. Um, that or some sort of... Uh, historical story behind it. Right, because we are in a historical space, the carriage house on um, Route 14, um, and so I'm glad that you guys have, like, you freshened it up when you took over, you know, you modernized it, you made it a little more cozy, but you definitely kept that character, and I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah the Fox Stand's a great old building uh, this year. We're actually going to be celebrating uh, in some way or another uh, its 200th birthday. It, oh. was, it was built in 1818. Fantastic. Uh, by a guy named Jacob Fox, and that's why it's called the Fox Den. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we're looking to do something celebratory with that. Maybe uh, keep an eye out for a couple of farm dinners that we're going to be doing on site mm -hmm. just to give people a better idea and uh, connect the consumer with the producer and how things are maybe growing on the farm, where the location is, just to kind of bring all of that general information into one space. Right. Very cool. Very cool. So I want to get back to food specifics. Um, right now, you guys are doing this burger special. Um, Robert, can you tell us a little bit more about that? It's in affiliation with the James Beard um, it is. It's Society? That, what, what is James Beard? Foundation. Foundation, okay, yeah. So it's the James Beard Foundation, something we started doing at least four or five years ago called the Blended Burger Project. So in order to help sustainability of meat products, it's, up, as it stated, a blended burger. So mm -hmm. it's a part of the grind, instead of being meat, also has mushrooms into the grind itself. So. Mm -hmm. 
it's an interesting combination in itself. These mushrooms add umami mm -hmm. inside of the burger, so you get a different depth than you would out of a regular burger. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a perfect program for us because a lot of what we do is based on sustainable products and, you know, supporting the local environment. So, being able to work with local mushroom producer, Thousand Stone Mushrooms, to actually bring in their nice. mushrooms, blend them into our burger, and, you know, kind yeah. of go hands in hand with their vision of helping, you know, sustainable cattle and what we do here. So. Right, yeah. So, instead of eating 100% beef patty, you're getting some other really awesome supporting local ingredients and meaning that you're not sucking up all those resources as quickly. Um, and how, and so there's voting involved, and um, tell us a little bit about that. There's voting involved. It's on the James Beard website. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, you can go try wherever else it does burgers. As mm -hmm. right now, I still believe we are the only place in Vermont to do it. Um, you can go on their website and actually you know, click to vote for the burger if you come in and you like it. So. Okay, fantastic. Very good. Yeah. Burger project. It's, it's going to be uh, a time limited thing that we do here, I believe it runs up until the 21st of July. The 31st. 31st. Yeah, 31st of July. Okay. And it's from 5 to 6 only. Okay. So at Wild Roots. At Wild You're Roots. doing like a burger happy hour. That makes sense. Yeah. For this location. Um, for those folks who are not in Vermont, um, we'll post a link to the James Beard uh, Foundation in our show notes, and you can find a restaurant in your local area that's uh, participating in this um, burger cook-off contest. Um, and we hope you'll try that out. Either, you know, whether it's a burger or if you're vegetarian, you know, try just a local restaurant that um, serves local ingredients, does the farm to table thing. Um, very cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, Robert, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your cooking philosophy, if you have one. Um, I know that local ingredients is important to you. In terms of your Preparation. I know you do some cured meats and some other in-house techniques. Can you tell me a little bit about like what inspires you or? Honestly, you know, the produce and the product that comes in yeah. really inspires me more than anything else. It's you know, uh -huh. figuring out which way would highlight it the most, treating mm -hmm. it as simply most of the time as possible, and being able to you know, truly highlight what's currently available. Right. I mean, I do do a lot of the preservation and curing because. Come winter time, you might have a little bit less available than, mm -hmm. you know, say during the peak of summer or spring. So, right. Try to just highlight the ingredient and preserve it so we can always be using local and supporting the you know, surrounding community throughout the whole year. Right. And does that include different things like pickling or yeah, curing? pickling, curing, fermentation, mm -hmm. just the whole plethora of preservation. Yeah. Um, so full, cool. like full utilization of product is really important to us. Right. So, you guys buy when you're when we're talking about animal meat, you buy like a half or a whole something, right? And then try to use it all. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. It's yeah. definitely, I think we believe that uh, every part of the animal does has had a use in one way or another. Mm -hmm. We were just using it for food specifically. Right, yeah. Well, you know, cheap scans, so it's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm with that philosophy. That's how yeah. I got into yeah. that, too. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Cool. Yeah. Um, anything else you'd like to add as you mentioned, Josh? Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we have upcoming. Um, nothing's coming to mind right away, but we do have a website that people uh, can follow up with a lot of information. We also have a couple of uh, social media um, platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, our website is uh, www.wildrootsvt.com. Mm -hmm. Our Instagram name is wildroots underscore vt. We also have a Facebook page. Right. And we'll link all that in the show notes, too, so you guys can find it. If you're in Vermont, I really highly recommend it. They're right off of 89, so they're very convenient to get to um, if you're traveling around the state. And, again, if you're not in Vermont or not planning a trip here, um, go ahead and, you know, do a Google search and look for local restaurants in your area that do support the local food movement and that support um, – sourcing their ingredients directly from farms you're really helping out not just the restaurant but the farmers too so thank you guys both for taking time off from your day off to be here with me it was really fun to yeah. sit down with you and do more than just say hi bring me food yeah. <laughs> so, thank you so much no, nice. thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, it's really important to us that you know we get the word out there um, in the correct way yeah so thank you so much oh sure yeah and um i, I think the local food movement's growing and i'm glad you guys are around and helping with that but watching it continue to grow is really cool. Thank so. you so much. Yeah. All right. And thank you guys for joining us. Thank Cheers. you. Thanks.